What's going on YouTube? We jump right back into Reasonautics top 20 and 64 greatest games of all time. And we're starting with a banger. We're starting with my all-time favorite game, not just on the Nintendo 64, or any Nintendo console for that matter, but in gaming period. In my gaming history, this is the creme de la creme. Now this was one of the original launch titles that came out for the N64 right alongside Mario 64. And together, these two games basically ushered in the 3D era of gaming for all of us and for every developer out there. Nobody knew how to do 3D until Nintendo did it. And so this game, much more, not, I don't want to say much more, but in a, such a different way than Mario 64, really gave us the sensation and the feeling of what it's like to maneuver around in a 3D space. Because this game allowed us to experience the majesty and the freedom and the magic of flight in a 3D space for the first time ever on a console. Uh, now, while it is a flight sim, it does have that light-hearted nature and that softened edge that Nintendo usually puts in their games, uh, being more, making it more accessible to all gamers. Uh, but it is a flight simulator at heart, and it allows you, just like the original on Super Nintendo, to use a, a variety of different vehicles for which you have to unlock licenses and, uh, and advance in the classes of license for those vehicles. So you have the hang glider, as you see here. The hang glider is is one a vehicle that basically offers the more relaxing, yet also the some of the most stressful missions at the same time. If I can make that uh, that pairing uh, it's relaxing because of the music and because it's it, there's no engines so it's very just you know smooth and laid back and you're just relying on the wind currents as you can see in the distance there's wind rising if i go into that current i'm going to rise up but some of them are very stressful because they'll be like okay you have to rise to a certain altitude and then land as close to three minutes as you can or something of that nature you know so that was the hang glider you had the the rocket belt which is basically a rocket pack added for a lot more speed and power and maneuverability uh in those missions you would be doing stuff like popping balloons or guiding a giant ball towards its target or navigating tight corridors uh without bouncing off the walls and then you had the gyrocopter the gyrocopter was basically a mini helicopter and you had a lot of seek and destroy missions with that where you would use the missile launcher to you know knock out targets or take on a giant mech uh, you also had uh, missions where you would fly through a, a certain number of rings uh, that take you on a certain path throughout the different islands. There are four islands in the game. You have uh, Holiday Island, you have Everfrost Island, which is this one, the, the snow-covered one. You have uh, Crescent Island, which is the tropical one you saw me hang gliding in. And then you also have Little States, which is literally a replica of the United States, which is awesome because every landmark is there. The Grand Canyon, the Twin Towers, the Statue of Liberty, uh, the Golden Gate Bridge, Mount Rushmore, all of that's there. Uh, the thing about this game that just made it so alive and so engaging for me was not only the controls and the freedom and, and the 3D aspect and the fact that you get to control all these awesome uh, vehicles, but the fact that the developers, for the first time we're dealing in a big open 3D world, they left no corner of that 3D world barren or un... un uh, tampered with so to speak they put little nooks and crannies and secrets all over the place and as you go unlocking gold and silver medals you will unlock uh bonus stages where you can do bonus activities like the birdman which is everyone's favorite where you have these artificial wings and you can literally just fly around the islands and explore to your heart's content no time limit no mission very very uh, endless ocean like which i love uh, also, you had, you know, a cannonball stage uh, where you use yourself as a human cannonball, try to hit targets. And in that one, you had to take wind conditions into account and all that. Uh, you had skydiving uh, where you would, you know, make different formations with your fellow characters as you descend. And then, you know, once you break the cloud cover, you had to focus on deploying your chute and landing. And then you had jumbo hopper, which was you had these boots on with these giant springs that let you jump over skyscrapers so you could traverse the entire map that way. Uh, and with those bonus activities, you were able to just explore the islands at your heart's content, man, and really just see all the little secrets and little, like, treasures that the, that the developers put, you know, tucked away in these levels. I mean, you got, uh, here, this is Little States right here. Little States is Mount Rushmore, for example. Mount Rushmore has Mario's face along with the presidents in it. But if you shoot a missile at it, or if you hit it as a human cannonball, he changes into Wario. You got 
a, a, a building in New York that has an open door in it. And if you're using the rocket belt like I'm using here, you can maneuver through the corridors of the inside of that building. And when you come out on the other side, you're in San Francisco on the extreme other coast of the of little states. So secrets like that, man, just kept the game alive and, and, and let you see that Nintendo was really, really just making a, a beast of a game, but disguising it as this calm, relaxing, uh, you know, basically lost in the shadow of Mario 64 title. Uh, but I don't think it's that at all, man. I think it's an amazing, amazing game. I think it's a masterpiece, bro. Uh, graphically, uh, you know, just fun factor wise, replayability. And again, there's nothing like for the first time ever. Again, this is 96, you gotta, you gotta remember that. But experiencing the freedom of three dimensional flight in a console with graphics of this nature. Back then, this was pretty much as close as you can get to lifelike. I know that's hard to believe now because of, you know, time and context, but this was 1996. So yeah, man, I mean, it was just an epic, epic game. Uh, it's why, and so many reasons why it's my favorite game of all time. But I mean, look how, look how high up you are here, man. Look at this. This was on a console back in 96. And look how, how well textured the ground and the island is and the water and everything looks real, man. So yeah, man, I mean, th th this and many, many other reasons why uh, this game belongs in Reasonautic's top 20 greatest Nintendo 64 games of all time, man. Hands down, bar none. Now we're jumping into F-Zero X. In this time, Nintendo, just like with Pilot Wings, just like with Mario, just like with so many other games, the, the games on the on the Super Nintendo were such masterpiece masterpieces and classics that Nintendo was like, let's not reinvent the wheel. We don't have to. If it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So they literally just took their IPs on Super Nintendo and faithfully recreated them in 3D and just added all the bells and whistles of having it in 3D. And that's what they did with F Zero X, man. F Zero X is quite possibly, if I'm not mistaken, the fastest performing game on the console. Lock 60 frames per second, will not dip beneath that. Super smooth, super crisp, uh, and, and literally you can feel the speed as you play. Uh, it's the same thing as always F-Zero, futuristic racing and these vehicles that travel, you know, hundreds and hundreds of kilometers per hour. You got loop-de-loops and corkscrews and big jumps and all that in the track design. Epic, epic soundtrack from stage to stage. Very heavy metal, rock inspired. Uh, and I, I just love it, man. And, and then if you look at, you know, the graphics are not as great as some of the other N64 games because they had to focus a lot of the horsepower of the console on making sure that the game was going to run as smooth and as fast as they wanted it to. So that's the reason you see that. But the graphics are still nothing to sneeze at, man. I love the backgrounds. Very post-apocalyptic. The, the futuristic cities. Like here in Silence, you have a track that's literally right above the night, the night, the night sky clouds. And as you go here, you see it start doing a course move going and going now it's sideways i mean it's so epic man and again the speed in this game is not to be messed with i know they made a sequel on the gamecube that everybody holds as the best f-zero game f-zero gx i will not fight you on that i understand that and i enjoy gx greatly but there's just something about f-zero x that to me is it's my favorite f-zero game of all time i mean bro 30 combatants 30 racers on the same track three laps to overtake them you would think that's not enough time but you're moving at such a fast pace and after every lap you get your boost power. Now, that comes with a price because as you see in the top right of the screen, there's an energy meter. Now, that will deplete as you take contact from other riders, as you bump off walls, and as you use your boost. So you have to take that into account while you're raising at, uh, racing at blistering speed. Look at this, in this tunnel, you just go around the entire thing like a corkscrew. It's just insane that the track design and the physics of this game for the time and at the speed that it's playing should not be possible. It should not have been possible at this time. But they did it and they nailed it you got these purple recharge stations here you go through them to get some of your energy back uh so that you can continue to use your boost as so you continue to take punishment as you bounce off other races and all that and not explode if that energy meter drops down to zero you will explode and you'll be retired and you'll lose one of your five or three lives depending on what difficulty you're playing but again look at the track design every track is unique distinct different color palette different surroundings uh different track design as far as like here this is a straight up course group. now you're upside down now you're sideways and now you're right side up again. I mean, it's so awesome, dude. It's, it's like a living, like super, super fast roller coaster, basically. That's what you're playing. Here, right into a loop, right up the, right up, right up the top of the race. And boom, cylinder. Now I can go all around this cylinder as I'm racing down. It's, it, look at this, it's insane, man. It, it was such a, an innovative game. 
Uh, and again, it's another racer. This is the third racer, I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, that I have on the top 20 list. Last video, you saw Diddy Kong Racing and Wave Race. I mean, you're gonna get a, you're gonna get a heavy dose of racers in the top 20 greatest games of all time for N64 because the N64 was just a, the, it was basically the fun machine. It literally was. It was multiplayer madness, and a lot of that was racing games. And you, you know everything from Diddy Kong, Wave Race, now F Zero. I mean, all of these were classics. All of these were just amazing. I don't think F Zero. I, I gotta double check that. I don't know if it had a four player mode, but I remember using this game on split screen for hours at a time and for summers non-stop with my cousins with my friends at sleepovers and just an epic epic game man and there's like 30 something different racers to unlock and you unlock them by you know winning first place in the different cups like i did here with this cup uh and every vehicle you can change it to four different colors you can literally manually adjust whether you want top speed or acceleration uh so you can you can tamper with the settings uh it's just a great great racer man there's not not a lot to be said bro it's literally the f-zero classic we, we loved on super nintendo just brought into the modern age for that time for 3D and just gave us an incredible sense of speed that the Super Nintendo was not capable of. And really the PlayStation, the N64's competitor was not capable of this because this was smacking the hell out of Jet Moto and the uh, Wipeout. I'm sorry, those are good games, but they don't touch this game at all, man. So for that and so many other reasons, F-Zero X, definitely on Reason Nautics, top 20 N64 games of all time. And there's no need to even ask a question about it, man. This is Snowboard Kids, man. Now, at first glance, you look at this and you're like, oh, this is a cheesy, cartoony, cutesy, little snowboard racing game. And you'd be right. But the problem that none of us took into account the first time we played this game was just how freaking fun it ended up being. This is Mario Kart on snowboards. Make no mistake about it. It's a Mario Kart clone, but it is done in such a fun way. They did not try to stray away from the formula that Mario Kart laid down. They literally just said, yeah, that's the funk, and we're doing that on snowboards. And so they did, man. And it was made by Atlas, which is known more as a an RPG developer now, but back then it was a simpler time where developers were just trying to make games that would be fun and would sell on these new consoles, man. And since this was the, the beginning of 3D, you know, they were trying their luck, man. I don't think, I don't know this for sure, but it feels to me like this game was never supposed to come stateside. I think it was a game that was only supposed to launch in uh, Japan, and it did so well in Japan, they said, ah, let's try our luck and see what we can do in the States. And here in the States, it got such a cult following that it, it was a gamble that paid off. Now, I don't know if it paid off financially, I don't know how the game sold, but I can tell you this was one of the funnest games. I want to say this was 97. Uh, I played this game year-round. Multiplayer madness with friends, family. Uh, the stage design was great because it, it's a snowboarding game, but they did not limit themselves because it's cartoony and it's extreme and it's Mario Kart style. They didn't limit themselves to, oh, just snow tracks, just mountains. Bro, there's grass tracks, there's desert tracks. They went all out, bro. They didn't care because it's it's fantastical, which that type of style, that fantasy type style. Uh, so the track design is awesome. The, the, the tracks are very long. Like if you look at this one, there's only two laps in the entire race because the track is so damn long, which is awesome because it gives so much opportunity for action to go crazy and to happen. You got power-ups like in Mario Kart. You got blue and red. Blue are your projectiles, I'm sorry, red are your projectiles that you could fire off like missiles, parachutes, uh, ice balls and all that. Blue are the more like, you know, uh, power-ups that, uh, that either affect the entire field or uh, affect the person in first place, like a ghost that slows down the person in first place, or rocks that you could drop behind you and trip them up like banana peels and things of that nature. So yeah, man, and the thing I loved about it was that as it's a racing game, right? So you got laps, right? But since it's a snowboarding game, they did keep one hint of realism, which was you're not going around the track and coming back to the finish line to complete your lap. No, you're going down a mountain. So what happens at the bottom, you get to a ski lift. And that takes you back to the top so you can start lap two. Now, the best thing about that is that when, when you're in a tight race and everybody's like, you know, side by side racing down towards that ski lift, somebody's going to get there a split second before everybody else and activate the gate and get on there. Everybody else is just going to smack off the wall and fall back. And then you're all basically just wrestling for position to try to get in there and get on the ski lift. So that's just another little element that the game adds that just makes it mayhem and multiplayer goodness, man. 
I mean, oh, and the soundtrack, bro. The soundtrack, this the game, th this game's soundtrack, what I love about it is that it has this retro vibe that even though we were in the N64 era, much more powerful than the Super Nintendo, much more powerful than the consoles it was competing with, like uh, PlayStation and Saturn. Uh, they still opted for a, a 2D, I'm uh, not 2D, I'm sorry, uh, uh, a 16-bit, even 8-bit type of soundtrack as far as the sound and the quality of the music. And it's just so, it works so good, man. It is so hum-worthy. Every song on every track, you will be humming while you're racing. If you're not, then you're just not you, and then you don't have a pulse, and I don't know what to, I don't know what to say to you. Uh, but, the, but the game, the soundtrack in the game is just phenomenal. I mean, when I was uh, cap capturing this footage and playing it to, for, to make this video, I was humming every single thing, and I remembered it like it was yesterday, and I hadn't played it in years, man. It does have a sequel, Snowboard Kids 2, which is also a great game. And in every right, it is technically a better game than this, but it didn't hit the way this did for me. So I constantly go back to the original. And it's, it's just another reason why this game belongs on my top 20 greatest N64 games of all time list. I mean, this game inspired multiplayer Bonanza Nights during the summer. I played it on my own to unlock, you know, the secret character and the different tracks. It's just a phenomenal, phenomenal game. Definitely worthy. That's just a, that's another power up right there, the, the 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 fan boost, man. You get that, and you start taking off, man. Can't nobody catch you. Now we're at you know a game everybody knew was gonna be on this list, a game everybody was knew, knew was gonna be on any video that's talking about the top games of all time on the N64, and that's GoldenEye 007. Now, what you guys need to understand about this game, this game had so many things going against it. First of all, at this point in time, only Turok had done a first-person shooter on a console successfully. But Turok didn't sell. I mean, Turok sold, but it didn't sell like this. Also, it was a movie tie-in game. Traditionally, those suck. So this broke the mold in so many ways. This showed developers and gamers first-person uh, gaming, first-person shooting, was not relegated to the PC. It could be done successfully and quite easily on a console. Also, it was a movie tie-in game that was not just decent, it was damn good. I mean, if you saw the 007 uh, GoldenEye movie back when it launched, this game follows it faithfully, but puts you in that world, in a 3D version of that world that you can actually control and interact with, and you can actually dictate the action. So while this game was known for its multiplayer disgustingness, I mean, it was one of the best multiplayer modes ever, and I'll get into that in a bit, uh, the single player campaign shined through and through. Because it puts you in that in that universe, in that movie, and you knew what the story was, you knew what was going to happen, but it did such a good job of, of, of taking you to the different locales and levels uh, and areas that you saw in the movie and allowing you to dictate the action and to take your paces through that, through that world as James Bond. You had all his gadgets, you had the watch laser, the proximity mines. You know the the data encryptor you know key copiers all that but then you also had a variety of weapons like the ak-47 which is it's called something else in this game k k47 soviet or whatever you had his traditional pp7 with a silencer without the silencer and also for a game as ambitious as this game was for being the first one of the first first person shooters on consoles that showed you it could be done it went above and beyond you could do a wheel you can have the same weapon in two hands you can have two different weapons in each hand I mean, it was crazy, man. Also, the objectives in the in the missions were were varied. You know, if you played it on you know your, your regular you know easy uh, uh, difficulty, you only had bare bones objectives to complete, so you could pass a level and move on. But if you wanted a challenge, you could replay and go back and play agent, double O agent, you know secret agent uh, dif uh, difficulties, and that would allow you to have many more objectives to complete within that world. That if you did not complete those objectives, if you missed one, the mission was failed. So it had a lot of replayability in that way. Uh, graphically, as you can see, I mean, this was, again, this was lifelike back then on the N64. You had all the characters. There's 006 uh, from the movie and from that universe. And it was just an epic, epic movie game. Now, the multiplayer. Jesus. Bro, the multi... Th this game, again, keep in mind, 1997, 98, around there. We didn't have Call of Duty Modern Warfare yet. We really didn't have, aside from PCs, we didn't have first-person shooters where you can go in and dictate every little thing about the multiplayer session you're about to have. Timing, the, the timing of the match, uh, what rules you're playing by, what weapons will be available, uh, you know, what characters, 
all the different parameters of the multiplayer session. You get to tinker with and dictate and, and decide what they're going to be. I know everybody here remembers uh, Slappers Only or Paintball Mode, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> in multiplayer. I mean, this game was this game was the premier game. This and the wrestling games on N64 were the games that you literally stayed at a friend's house or they stayed at your house summer. You had a sleepover. They slept over for the entire weekend from Friday to Sunday uh, evening. And you stayed up every day watching the sun come up, eating pizza and drinking Mountain Dew with four multicolored N64 controllers around that magical console. And you enjoyed this game and everything it had to offer, man. Countless hours, countless sessions. People, I mean, we had rules like, oh, it's not fair. You can't play as odd job. He's too small. He can get he, he can get away from fire and anybody, anybody that picks him is basically at an advantage. Man, you could say, all right, you know what? This round, we're only using rocket launchers. This round, we're using only Moonraker lasers. This round, we're doing slappers only. Nobody has any weapons. You just slap the, fuck, you slap the snot out of each other, man. I mean, it was awesome. Uh, so, yeah, man, the multiplayer mode, the single player mode, the authentic 007 uh, music and soundtrack from the film were there. Uh, and even though it was polygonal models and not really as good as they are today, for back then, like I said, this was lifelike. So you had the likeness of Pierce Brosnan who played 007 during that time. You had the likeness of every actress and actor that was in that movie mapped onto the faces of the characters that you were playing in this game. So when you went to the multiplayer uh, multiplayer mode and you picked whatever character, you could look at their face and that, that was them. It, it was it was insane. Man. Uh, and, and again, it wasn't just run and gun shooting. There were different objectives, man. So it was just it's such an epic, epic game, man. So yeah, man, 007 Goldeneye on the N64, you crazy, if, the, if you think this is not going to be on my top 20 greatest N64 games of all time, man, please. And of course, we got to include the premier racer on the N64, Mario Kart 64. Man, this was got to remember man before this game there was only one real mario kart game i'm sure there was uh one or two on the game boy or game boy Advance. uh but you know mainline mario kart games you had super mario kart on the end on, on the super nintendo epic racer epic idea it was like nintendo being ultra creative and saying let's take all our characters put them in go-karts and have them just destroy each other on on tracks that are featured throughout the nintendo universe at that time it was really strictly the mushroom kingdom so what happens? You go to the N64 again. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Take that, put it in 3D, make it bigger, better, prettier, smoother, and add a few new power-ups that weren't there before because now you have more memory, more RAM to work with, and you got gold, man. Now, keep in mind, I've said it, and I've been on record saying, my favorite kart racer of all time is Diddy Kong Racing over any Mario Kart. I, I love the Mario Kart series. Uh, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe is creme de la creme mario kart 64 was one of my favorites mario kart double dash is probably my favorite mario kart but man there was just a variety in diddy kong racing that, that put it above for me but diddy kong racing didn't come until after this now this was the premier 3d kart racer on the console and what they did here was that they took every track i mean yeah there were some new tracks i mean this game is responsible for some legendary tracks yoshi's valley uh, this one right here, Koopa Beach. I always love the Koopa Beach tracks in every Mario Kart because I'm just a sucker for the tropical beach environment uh, in gaming and just in real life. I love it. But, you know, I remember Koopa Beach on Super Nintendo. Yeah, it was cool. It was fun. Bro, this, how real it looked and how and, and the different shortcuts and all that that were available. Uh, it was just epic, man. Uh, Yo like I said, Yoshi's Valley. Uh, uh, I think it's Wario Stadium. I think that's what it's called. So many great tracks, man. And what they did was they, did make, they made the tracks bigger, badder, more open. You got different paths you can take uh, in 3D. I mean, here you got this is a this is a I forgot the name of this uh, track, but either way, there's this train that goes around the entire race. And as you're going to go across the train tracks, it's very likely that train might be coming, and you got to stop. If you don't stop on time, you're going to plow right into it, and you're going to get launched up in the air, and people are going to pass you. So the game had different stage hazards depending on what stage you were in. Music was top notch. It's Mario Kart. You know how it is, man. And I mean, it was just a beautiful, beautiful thing. You had the different options, as always, as you did before, of going from 50cc, 100cc to 150cc. My favorite character was always Yoshi, and in later, um, later games was Koopa, the, the, the Koopa, Koopa Troopa. I love them. 
But uh, but yeah, man. I mean, here you can see, bro. It's the same 3D model of Princess Peach's castle from Mario 64. Uh, and it's just like they Nintendo was basically just weaving this universe together. That in every game that you saw all these characters and these locales, it all tied together, man. You got oh, this is another classic stage. Uh, Toad's uh, Highway. Oh man, with the traffic and all that weaving in and out of it. Man, you don't you be careful. You you skid too far, you might hit a car, get launched up in the air. It's crazy, man. It, it's, it's the innovative track design in this game was so much fun, man. And it's one of those games again that you know, countless summer nights, staying up late, playing Mario uh, Mario Kart 64 with friends. This game began and ended friendships, yo, know, straight up. Because dudes would get that serious. <laughs> like if you if you were just like you know. If you were just pissing them off on the track, hitting them with the same red shell over and over again, or the, the dreaded blue shell, oh man, <laughs> it was it was a war, man. But yeah, man, this is another one. This is the the chocolate chocolate mountains or whatever. Uh, I, I I get lost on the names, man, because there's so many different Mario Kart games at this point. But yeah, this is the this is the stadium one I was telling you about. Just epic epic stage design, man, and and track design. Uh, and you know the jumps and the, the power-ups in this game. I believe this is the game where they added the, the fake block uh, the, You know the, the block that if you hit you get damaged. Uh, I don't think that was in Super Nintendo I think that was introduced here. Uh, you also had the triple mushroom like you're seeing here You had the the, the, the the perpetual mushroom that you could just use it as long as you have it over and over again Spam it the blue shell made its introduction here. I mean and then again like I said the, the stage look at the reflection of the ice as I'm racing on it again This is 97 98 ish man like, you're not supposed to have graphics as good at that time, but Nintendo did. Uh, man, this game, bro, it, it has so many memories in my in my memory bank that I think back to. Uh, I even remember people that I haven't seen in 20, 25, 30 plus years. It's just crazy, man. But there you have it, man. That's uh, Reasonautics Top 20 N64 Greatest Games of All Time Part 2. Look forward to Part 3. It's in production now, man. God bless y'all. Stay game. Peace.